Back to 2 Corinthians, please. There's a very strong warning given by Paul in this chapter, verse 16, 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. This is always used in connection with marriage between Christians and non-Christians. It means more than that. But it does mean that. And don't make the mistake of thinking that if someone goes to church, they're necessarily a Christian. It doesn't follow at all. Probably the majority that go to Christian churches are not truly converted Christians. They're there for other reasons, family, business, so on. So don't make the mistake of saying, well, he's fallen in love with a girl and she must be all right because she goes to church. Don't believe it. Or he's fallen in love with a guy and he must be all right because he goes to church. Don't believe it. You have to know a person over a long period of time for you know whether they're truly Christian. And remember, in a typical marriage, you can face uh, something like uh, 50,000 meals together. Got to wear well. <laughs> Got to wear well. Yeah. But it means more than just uh, a marriage. It means business and it means friendships. Now, Christians have to be social to save. I make friends with a lot of people who are not committed Christians. But one thing in mind for me is I long to be able to help them to Christ. And if we don't have that in mind, our friendship is not really valid. We want the best for them. And the best is Christ. So that warning is broader than just marriage, but it's certainly belongs to marriage. Chapter 7, since we have these promises, dear friends, let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Notice the connection between body and spirit. That is so important. Henry Ward Beecher said, half the morbid ills from which Christians suffer arise from a poor state of health. Half the spiritual ills from which Christians suffer arise from a poor state of health. There's a connection between body and spirit. Don't neglect it. The laws of nature are the laws of God. We are to obey them. Please observe verse 10 and 11. <clears throat> Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. When you feel sad, you should ask yourself, am I sad because I'm an idolater? Am I sad because I'm not getting what I want? Am I sad because I'm discontented? Am I sad because people don't love me enough? When you feel depressed and sorrowful, you must always ask why it is. If it is only a worldly sorrow and you don't know Christ, it can lead to illness and death. A dear friend of ours who passed away about a year or two ago, officially of heart attack, but we think that was probably constant stress. The one he loved most in life suffered from breast cancer for years and that can bring great, great agony. And this dear man, a wonderful man, had had stress year after year after year, unremitting stress and suddenly a heart attack. Well, many cases of heart attack are from constant stress. Unless you have the gospel to lift you up, stress can be a killer. And even with the gospel, constant stress will be a danger to you. So Paul is very honest when he says the sorrow of the world can bring death. Avoid as much as you can situations where there is too much stress and be clear that the stress isn't because of your idolatrous instincts, that you're discontented, you don't have what you want or who you want. We need to examine ourselves. The next chapter is very important. As a matter of fact, there are two chapters that follow, and they're both about money. Now, Christians shouldn't talk about money. They certainly should, 
Christ did. Sermon on the Mount. You cannot serve God and mammon. Take this verse from Christ. Luke 16, verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with very much. But then in verse 11, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Money is mentioned 1,564 times in the Bible. 16 out of our Lord's 29 parables have to do with money or possessions because your attitude to money will reveal your attitude to God. That's simple, isn't it? Your attitude to money reveals your attitude to God. And if you're dishonest with money, you'll be dishonest with God. To be a true Christian means to be a giver. And it means to give with a song, not a sigh. And your giving's not measured by what you give, but by what you haven't given, by what's left over. What you do in this life is measured by what you could do in this life. So money is a bit of an index of where my heart is. You cannot serve God and mammon. If money is the big thing, the all-consuming thing, well, God isn't. Many people think that tithing is just a Jewish ordinance, but it came in a long time before Moses. Tithing is first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 14, where Abraham, in gratitude for his victory, gave tithes to the priest king, Melchizedek. But tithing's only mentioned once in the New Testament and they're in bad repute about the Pharisees because the New Testament takes it for granted that if we're truly Christians, we'll give to God all we've got apart from survival. All we've got apart from survival because we own nothing, because we're only stewards the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. So here are two chapters, eight and nine, about money. And it's reminding us that it's a good revelation of our hearts and of how much we really care for God, the way we handle money. God wants to teach us to be faithful stewards. The Bible foretells the day will come when the wicked will cast their gold and their silver to the moles and the bats. And in the last part of the New Old Testament, it says, will you rob God? If we're not good stewards, we're robbing God. So in chapters 8 and 9, Paul uses every incentive he's got to help people to be givers because to be a Christian is to be a giver. God so loved that he gave. Every Christian has to be a giver. We've got reason to be. Have you ever heard this? This will tell you some of the reasons why we all should be good givers and good stewards. The world and you in perspective. If you live in a good home, have plenty to eat, and can read, you're a member of a very select group. If you have a computer, you are among the elite. If you woke up this morning with more health than illness, you're more fortunate than the million who won't survive this week. If you've never experienced the danger of battle, the loneliness of imprisonment, the agony of torture, the pains of starvation, you are ahead of 500 million people in the world. If you can attend a church meeting without fear of harassment, arrest, torture or death, you're fortunate. More than half the world cannot. If you have food in the refrigerator or if you have a refrigerator, clothes on your back, a roof over your head and a place to sleep, you are richer than 75% of the world. If you have money in the bank, in your wallet, and spare change in a dish, you're among the top 8% of the world's wealthy. 
If your parents are still alive and still married, you're very rare. If you hold up your head with a smile on your face and are truly thankful, you are blessed because the majority can, but most do not. If you can hold someone's hand and hug them or even touch them on the shoulder, you are blessed because you can offer healing touch. And if you can read this, you're doubly blessed as over two billion of the people in the world cannot read at all. So all of us in this room have been great receivers and heaven asks, are we great givers? And that doesn't just mean money. The most important thing you can give is yourself. It's sometimes very easy for the wealthy to write a cheque. It's not easy for them to sit down, talk to an hour to someone in trouble. So if we've been great receivers, we are to be great givers. We'll just look at one or two verses before we close. Would you kindly observe verse 9 of chapter 8? You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Verse 12, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Verse 15, as it's written, he who gathered much did not have too much, he who gathered little did not have too little. And I'd particularly refer you to two verses in chapter 9, three verses. First of all, verse 6, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. You know, people think to save money, and what they're doing is they're so confining their hearts that heaven can't bless them. Verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound, in the Greek, to all good works, all the alls, able to make all grace abound so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. What a promise. But that's for givers. We've been great receivers. Are we great givers? F.B. Meyer, if he lived today, probably wouldn't write what he wrote 100 years ago, but he wrote, next to the talent of speech, money has the greatest power in the world. Wouldn't be true today, nuclear weapons would take over. But why would he say that? Because money can be an agency of great blessing if it's used for the spread of the gospel. And that's the main reason God has given to each one of us money. Not just to live, not just to exist, but to help other people find the gospel. The last verse, chapter 9. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. In other words, when we think of the gospel and realise that God gave his son and with his son he gave eternal life, with eternal life he gave the verdict of the last judgement. In other words, God has emptied heaven for a lot of sinners and he rejoices to do it. But all heaven looks down, the angels look down to see whether our hearts have been broken by the generosity of God, whether I am living as someone whose heart has been convulsed, changed, transported with joy because of the love of God. Does my life show it? The way I use money, the way I use my own personal sympathies and faculties and abilities to help other people. Do I live for God? Am I a good steward? If so, heaven will say, the unspeakable gift has not been in vain for him or for her. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have been such a great giver to us who have been often so mean. We pray you'll enlarge our hearts to our hearts like yours and that we too are great givers in love and in kindness and in dutiful service to all that we meet. Amen.